that a life worth living is one where we give back with tremendous service. Hey, good day to you. Morning, evening, whatever it is. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 346. Today, I'm joined by Master Chris Natsky. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and we make stuff. We make all kinds of stuff. In fact, as I am recording this, we have a huge batch of our first ever uniforms arriving. Got the first box yesterday. Three more boxes expected today. And they are awesome. I'm so excited. Now, if you haven't checked out any of our products, head on over to whistlekick.com and I've got an exclusive code for you. Podcast 15. Here we are. It's nearly 350 episodes in. I think this is the first time we've ever released a discount code on the show. Um, I think I was just spacing because every other podcast I listen to does this. So why shouldn't we? Podcast 15, that'll get you 15% off anything over there. Of course, we also have most of our products available on Amazon, so you can shop there too. We do offer free shipping, so it's not just free shipping on Amazon. If you want the show notes to this or any other episode, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And you can sign up for the newsletter. We have other discounts available once in a while. We tell you more what's going on behind the scenes. Just kind of give you some more context for the show through the newsletter, through the show notes. Help you round out your life as a traditional martial artist. Now let's talk about today's episode. I first met Master Natsuki a few years ago through the Superfoot group, and he's a great guy, an amazing martial artist, incredibly flexible, and really kind. I think that's the number one thing that has struck me from my interactions with Master Natsuki is just, he's such a great guy. So when I reached out to him and invited him to come on the show, I wasn't surprised when he said yes, because He's a nice guy. He does this kind of stuff. But what did surprise me, unfortunately, was that we had this wonderful conversation. And then through my own technical fallacies, I lost that episode. It did not record. So he was gracious enough to try again. And it actually came out a bit better the second time. We got into some different stuff, some stuff that I was blown away with. He's an open and authentic person. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy this conversation. So here we go. Master Natsuki, welcome yeah. to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thanks so much, Jeremy. It's great to be here. Thank you. And, you know, I'll be honest. I, I try to be open. I try to be authentic with everyone. Full disclosure, this is round two because <laughs> I screwed up round one. I, I didn't click the button. We had this great conversation and I didn't click the button. And I appreciate your graciousness in forgiving my mistake and doing this a second time around. You're very welcome. No worries. I, I'd, I'd love to say that was the first time that happened. Um, <laughs> with the old system with Skype, it, it happened periodically. We had, I think, five episodes that recorded silence. Oh. So that was fun. Okay. And uh, yeah, but everyone that we redid, which, and everyone said yes, when we redid them, they actually came out better. All right. So I, I so hopefully we can continue that streak. Okay, so the bar has been set. Is that the what you're bar? Talking? The bar has been set, and you set it pretty high last time. So, all right. <laughs> all right. Of course, this is not how Jeremy messed up recordings radio. This is martial arts radio. So let's talk about martial arts. Let's talk about you and how you got started. What's what's that story? You know, I um, I actually started uh, back in September of 1973. Um, I was a, a short little chubby kid at the time, and I became very enamored with a TV show. That was on the time called Kung Fu uh, with David Carradine playing Kwai Chen Kane. And, uh, mm. you know, at that period of time, martial arts was really in a, in a real infancy stage in the United States. Uh, it certainly had been around for about 20, 30 years. But uh, this was right also at the um, just the beginning or the, the wave was beginning the crest of the Bruce Lee stage. And so I walked into my first um community center program and totally fell in love with what I saw. And uh, interesting thing about it is that was a time period where martial arts was basically done by a bunch of 20 year old men. Uh, and they were an occasional female, but very few kids were in the class. So I was kind of, uh, you know, kind of the team mascot there for a while, but uh, I've stuck with it ever since. Do you think they treated you differently because of the age difference? You know, I, I think there was a, um, 
Well, I'd, I'd like to think that I was pretty serious about what I was doing. So after a while, I was uh, accepted pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an environment where I, I felt I was going to be messing around, nor did I want to. And I feel I was, I was pretty well treated and, uh, and accepted into the group. That's good. You know, I find that when, when a, a child, you know, whether that's a, a very young child, a teenage child, somebody kind of steps up and they're doing something at a higher level and, and their peers in that space tend to be much older. Mm-hmm. All they have to do is prove themselves. And not only do they receive the typical attention that everyone would, but everyone kind of takes them under their wing. And and I've experienced that at times, you're nodding your head. I, I'm just you end up with, instead of one instructor, everyone is looking out for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely what happened in my, uh, in my situation. And again, it was a great, great experience for me was, was very, very much uh, treated as one of the, one of the guys, if you will, and um, felt a lot of respect and felt a lot of safety and felt a lot of encouragement. So it was really positive for me. Nice. And so here you are, you're, you're participating, you're serious about it and you're just kind of chugging along. But at some point, you know, martial arts became your life. What did that transition look like? When did you know that was going to happen? Well, and I, and I shared the story with you last time, and I, I oftentimes share this story anytime I do any kind of public speaking, because this was a real pivotal moment in my life. Um, so I started in my martial art training, as I said, in 73. And about three years after that is when I met the man that I still consider to be my um, one of my main instructors today, and that was Grandmaster J.K. Lee. And Grandmaster Lee had recently come from Korea, and his school was basically 30 miles east of where I lived. So yeah, I lived in southeastern Wisconsin, the Milwaukee area, and so I would have to drive in 30 miles one way just to train with him. And it wasn't as if it is today where there's a martial arts school on every corner. Uh, it wasn't that way at all. So, of course, it was a pretty pretty long drive, but I was there three, four days a week training with him. And one of the first days I was in his class, um, I was seated in the back of the room with my legs spread wide. I was stretching out, getting ready to go. And he walked into the room, right onto the deck, as he always did with this amazing power and presence. And pretty soon I realized he was looking directly at me. And before I could move a muscle, he had come and sat down in front of me. And he put his right foot on the inside of one leg, his left foot on the inside of the other. He grabbed the ends of my belt and with one push pull, split me out to 180 degrees. And uh, like I like to joke, um, joke I got from Grandmaster Bill Wallace, you know, anyone can do the splits once. That's the first thing I learned. (laughs) But the second thing is, is that uh, he looked at me deep in the eyes and he said to me, I will make you a champion. I will make you a champion. And when you're 13 years old, it has a huge impact on you. And I literally flew home, glided home, telling my parents what he had said. And I truly believed it. And it was really the first time, I think, in my life when I had a male role model who I really loved, respected, admired, uh, claim greatness for me. And it was really a powerful moment for me and still stays with me to this day. Mm. Yeah, we did talk about that that last time. And and the part I was struck, and I, I have to say, I'm just as struck as you're saying it again here today. The use of that word, champion. That's not a word that gets thrown around. I mean, in, in some spaces, you know, if we're talking about professional sports, if we're talking about very high level competition where there is some determinant of a, a successor. But when we talk about a champion, we don't tend to talk about that in the context of a 13 year old at a martial arts class. Yeah. But, you know, I, and I, and this is my own interpretation of this, but it has incredibly served me throughout my life, so I'm going to stay with it, is what I oftentimes share with audiences is, you know, my initial reaction to that was, oh, I'm going to be a champion in the ring. I'm going to go to the Olympics. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. And I did have my fair amount of success in the ring. But what I really came to realize as years went by is he was really talking about being a champion in life, right? That That's what his real goal was. And You know, for me, it comes in three areas. It comes in, you know, having a really powerful vision for what we want to create. Uh, The other way is champions know how to move through obstacles with grace and with confidence. And then finally, and what I was taught from Grandmaster Lee is that uh, real champions live a life of service. 
You know, they, they take their gifts and they go out and they give back. And uh, those are the three things that I took from that and still stay with me, stay with me to this day. Hmm. You know, when, when you think of those three things, the service component is something that seems to happen for a lot of folks kind of later on in their career. And just the things that I see you doing on your social media, it seems like that's a focus of what you're doing. Am I accurate there? It's, it's kind of what I feel is my work, right? Okay. Um, you know, I was given a gift, um, which I've just shared with you throughout my entire life where I had people that were really looking out for me and really serving me. And I've been very blessed with a lot of things that have happened in my life. I've had my challenges as well. But I really think that a life worth living is one where we give back with tremendous service. Because that's where our legacy is going to be, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, whether whatever role we play, whether it's, it's spouses, uh, sons, daughters, parents, instructors, um, it's like Maya Angelou says, you know, people will, they won't remember what you say or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And I think when we are able to take our life gifts and turn them into service to others, and then we empower others to do the same, that's how we move our world ahead. That's how we make the world a better place. So well said. Now you've mentioned Grandmaster Wallace. How did you meet him? So, uh, you know, he was, I have to admit, and I've told him this many times, he was my hero growing up. So you have to remember in the early 70s, um, there wasn't the videos that we have access to. There wasn't YouTube. There wasn't anything. So I basically, I got to see him. I'd already been following him in, in martial art magazines. And then um, <laughs> I was babysitting for the next door neighbor one night. And my mom calls me up and says, you need to turn on the television this thing called the World Professional Karate Championships are on. So at 11 years old, I flipped it on and soon came Bill Wallace, it wasn't called Superfoot at the time, just Bill Wallace. And he was the, the middleweight um, United States representative and ended up winning the world title. And he was absolutely the star of the entire tournament. And that's where Joe Lewis won the, the heavyweight title, Jeff Smith, the light heavyweight title. Uh, Inesias Duenas won the lightweight title, but Wallace by far, just outshine anyone because he was the one person that could kick and do it so impactfully, so effectively. And I remember at 11 years old looking at that going, I, one day I want to kick like him. So he was just my hero and I really did my best to emulate my style after his. And I think it was in 1985. Um, yeah, it was, 19, uh, no, actually 1986, 1986. Um, I got a call from one of my buddies. I was working and living and working in Chicago at the time. And called me up and he said, hey, Bill Wallace is coming for a seminar and up in Appleton, Wisconsin. You need to come uh, come check it out. So I couldn't say yes fast enough and um, was married at the time, had a had a one year old son and drove up and met him. And we've been friends ever since. I, I, I you know, I I had emulated his style, I think, close enough. I was anywhere, nowhere close to as fast as he was, but I have the flexibility and the technique. So I think. He gravitated toward me, and I was assistant during the uh, during the seminar. And then uh, afterwards, he came up. He goes, "Hey, we're going out to dinner. Come join us." And so after that, a friendship was formed, and uh, a real love, admiration, and respect that uh, continues to this day. He's certainly a good man, and and that that invitation to go out to dinner. You know, I remember the first time that he invited me out for dinner. It was there was nothing better than <laughs> that 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 moment, that realization right. that not only does he realize that you're a human being and that you are on the same plane as him and he can speak to you, but inviting someone to share a meal, I, I think that is, that there's something really special about sharing a meal. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, and I, I think, and I think I shared this the last time we talked, um, you know, of course I've got to know him very well throughout the years and get to travel with him and had him out to Denver on several occasions and, and whatnot. And, and one time in particular that really had an indelible impact on me, I was competing in the National Taekwondo Championships in 98 and 99. And during one of those years before the tournaments, I reached out to him and said, hey, you know, I'd love to come work with you, get ready for this, this tournament. And he said, well, hey, I'm going to be doing this swing up in Northern California. Uh, he had been living in Southern California at the time. He said, why don't you come on out? We'll get in a car. And we'll drive up the coast and we'll, you can do these seminars with me and we'll, we'll, we'll train. So I flew out to Orange County. We got in his car. 
Um, you have to be a um, you have to be a fan of oldies music if you're going to drive with him, which is something I had to learn to do. But uh, so we made the eight hour drive up, and so we we were hitting these schools in the San Francisco Bay Area, and this one uh, in particular really impacted me. We did he taught the seminar, and um, got done. It was after you know two two and a half hour seminar. He did. It was in a smaller school, but it was owned by a man who it was a family operation, and he we had a potluck dinner that he put on afterwards. And right after the seminar, right after Grandmaster Wallace delivered the seminar, he could have certainly shook the guy's hand, collected his check and walk out the door, but that's not at all what he did. He stayed for the potluck and literally sat with the school owner and for like two hours and just talked with him. And this was a guy that was probably in his thirties or forties, but he was hanging on, on his every word. And he looked like a literally like a kid in a candy shop going, oh my gosh, Bill Wallace is in my school and he's talking to me. And, and I realized that's what also makes him really special is the ability to connect with people. And I mean, he made that guy's night, probably made his year. And I thought, wow, he didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. So that was really powerful for me. And for me, watching him interact with others is probably the greatest business lesson yes. I think that anyone could ever learn because not only is he there and he's giving the time, but he's actually present. He actually cares. Yes. And if you've seen him bump into, I know you have, but if any of the listeners have ever seen him bump into someone that he met maybe five or 10 years prior, there's a good shot. He'll remember that. It's it's absolutely true. And it's scary, but it's true. Yep. Yep. In fact, another little known fact about him is I've, I've had an occasion of pulling out old martial art magazines and I'm talking about, you know, from the seventies and eighties and, you know, open them up and have a tournament where he's featured. And he not only remembers the tournament, he remembers all the matches and what the scores were and what he hit people with in order to win the tournament. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) He's like a martial arts savant, you know? (laughs) And I think really he is, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll say to describe him and then we'll, we'll come back and talk to you talk about you more but it's it's important for listeners to know that so much of of his influence has created you has made you who you are so i I don't feel bad i was talking about him a little bit i believe everyone has the thing that they could do better than anyone else Mm -hmm. but most of us don't find it Mm -hmm. he clearly did yeah absolutely yeah absolutely that's very special very i am very blessed like i said i've had I've been blessed to have some great uh, instructors, mentors, friends throughout the years, and he's definitely at the top of the list. Nice. Now, when you think about your your years, your time training, your time as a martial artist, all these stories that you've got, what's your favorite story? Well, I'll tell you what. This is this is going to be um, this is going to be a martial art related story, but it's going to be one that isn't necessarily about kicking and punching. So okay. one of the things that, um, let's see, back in 2004 and 2005, I was one of the first participants in a program called the Ultimate Black Belt Test. It was put on, and I, it may have just, uh, it may have just stopped, uh, he may have just stopped doing it, but, but Master Tom Callos, who's a great friend of mine, started this program back in 04 and 05. And what he did is he brought um, 30 master instructors from all over the world together to do this black belt test. That wasn't something that we did on a weekend. We actually did it over um, over 13 months. So during that time, you know, we had to log things like 52,000 push-ups and 52,000 crunches and spar a thousand rounds and do a form a thousand times. And so there was, it was pretty, it was pretty commanding that way. And then we did things like um, we had to um, do body for life and we had to create a thousand acts of kindness and, and 10,000 random acts of kindness within our martial art community. And then we also had to do what were days of empathy. So we had to spend a day being blind, being deaf mute and being in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So that for me was an incredibly impactful program. It was not only a martial art program, but a life, coaching program, which I absolutely, uh, I just, it was an amazing experience. I absolutely loved it. So anyway, I took that and I created my own version of that for my students who are black belt testing. So of course, 
they they don't do it over 13 months. They do it over four months, and they're not professional martial artists, so the requirements are are a little bit less. But everyone who goes through our program, the final four months before they test, they have to do 4,000 push-ups, 4,000 crunches. They have to um, spar, you know, 120 rounds. They have to run 40 miles. But that's not what I'm most uh, proud of. They have to do four, uh, 400 random acts of kindness. Um, I misspeak a little bit. The kids, the juniors have to do only 300, but they have to make up the difference with 100 home chores. So parents love me, right? Uh, <laughs> they have to uh, mentor someone for 10 sessions. They have to eat clean for an entire week. So no sugar, no processed foods, no alcohol. You know, getting the getting the ten year olds off beer is tough, but we make it happen. And then the final one is they they have to choose between this day of empathy, being in blind, deaf, mute, or in a wheelchair. So I have this one student. His name is Josh, and Josh has been with me since he was four years old. Uh, came in as a little ninja, little you know, big, bushy red hair, freckles, you know, glasses, and uh, he man, he stuck with it. And now he's ten years old, and he's going to get ready to test for his junior black belt. So he, he's going through the process and he has to choose his day of empathy. And he says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend my day in a wheelchair. And the reason is because he has an uncle Jimmy and his uncle Jimmy was a Vietnam vet. And for as long as Josh has known him, he's been in a wheelchair. So he calls up uncle Jimmy and he says, Hey, uncle Jimmy, I'm going to be testing for my black belt. I'm going to be doing a day of empathy and I'm going to spend a day in a wheelchair and I'm going to do it in honor of you. And Uncle Jimmy pauses, and then he says, well, you know, Josh, I know you too well. If you spend a day in the chair, all you're going to be doing is mess around, flying down the street, popping wheelies. If you're going to do this, you're going to do it right, and you're going to spend two days in the chair. So on the second day, Uncle Jimmy drives up in his customized van and lowers the hydrock lift, and Josh rolls on, and um, Uncle Jimmy drives Josh and his dad to Craig Hospital here in Denver, and takes him to a rehabilitation ward where Josh gets to see a man who's a new quadriplegic breathing through a tube in order to move his chair. So as you might imagine, that was pretty impactful for a 10 year old to see. So he comes back home and he's supposed to write an essay that he's supposed to turn into me. But before he turns it into me, he sends it to uncle Jimmy and Jimmy reads it and he goes, wow, this is really good. And he sends it into the headquarters of the disabled American veterans association. Well, they read it and they go, wow, this is fantastic. And they publish in their national newsletter. So now all of a sudden, this is spreading all around the country. This kid's in Denver, 10-year-old, testing for his black belt. And people are like, wow, Denver, Denver, our national convention is in Denver. Let's have him come speak. So now here's Josh in front of 250 disabled American veterans reading his paper. So as I like to say, at 10 years old, he wasn't only a junior black belt, but he was a published author and a keynote speaker. Wow. And what I love to, to just close this out is I'm friends with Josh's family. And I, I literally, he just, I just saw on, on the internet, he, on Facebook, he turned 22. Uh, he turned 22 this uh, last week. But I, I had dinner with him and his family uh, about six months ago, and he still talks about that experience. He still talks about that experience. So that's what I think the martial arts can do is when we are helping people understand other people and they have that sense of empathy and then they realize that to those to whom much is given, much is expected and then use their power to make the world a better place, then we've done our job as, as instructors. I love it. I love so much about what you just said. Now, there may be some folks listening who are hearing this or are thinking, you know, gosh, I, maybe maybe 20 years ago, parents would have supported this, but I don't, you know, how do I, how do I get somebody to do 4,000 push-ups? And, and yeah, I can get the parents on board for the chores if it's a kid, but just this, this general feeling that this is too much. Oh, uh, well, let me tell you, my friend, I'm laughing because... Um... I think the last count I've had, we've been doing this since, well, like I said, two, probably 2005 is when we started uh, doing this. I think I've taken about six to 700 students through this process. Uh, we actually have, our organization has an online program 
where everybody logs all their reps. And I just did another black belt testing two weeks ago and everyone did it. And everyone, that's just what our expectation is. And we tell people, you know, we don't, you're not going to take your test on a day. You're going to experience your test over four months because we know that when we do that, those lessons are going to stay with them. And the other cool thing about that is we've logged over 250,000 random acts of kindness during that period as well. So that's a quarter of a million acts that have hopefully made a ripple effect in our Denver area and beyond. So we, we pre-frame it. We tell people this is what it is. And it's not easy, but nothing is if it's really worth something. And I always tell students they're going to remember earning their black belt. And uh, quite honestly, we retain a very high number of students afterwards as well. But we're, we're very active in helping them understand what the next levels are and, um, and you know, just what a great, uh, great thing it is that they accomplished. I love it. I love what you're saying. And I, I fully believe that people will rise to the occasion. Wherever Absolutely. you set the bar, that's where people are going to get to. My, my anecdote for that is goldfish. Yep. Goldfish will grow yep. to the size of the bowl you put them in. Right. And I've always found people to be very similar. And the other thing that we do within that process is Every one of the students is assigned one of the black belt instructors as their mentor. So they, and not only I'm talking more of the younger students now, but the older students receive mentorship as well. And so they have someone who's gone through the process before them and they're helping them through the entire, you know, 16 weeks and making sure that they're on track and helping them. And, you know, and, and as I explained to the students, when we kick things off, it's not the mentor's responsibility to get through it's their responsibility ultimately as the student, as the candidate, but the mentor is there to help them. And it actually bonds the school together because now you've created this big brother, big sister kind of uh, relationship. And so the new black belts have a mentor built in to help them throughout their continued progress through the school. You kind of set me up for this question that I wasn't planning on asking, but it's become such a, a subject on the show of late. I, I'm going to ask it. We've set up martial arts through our, our explicit and really our implicit marketing that black belt is the goal. And in so many schools, once people reach that first degree, showed on, whatever you call it, they fade away. And they fade away in such great numbers. But you mentioned something that makes me feel like you address that, that you don't present that as the goal. So maybe for the school owner out, school owners out there listening, you could speak to that for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be, I'd be happy to, because I think it's the it's one of the more important concepts of a of a, a vibrant school and a vibrant association, um, because otherwise, what's your incentive to get students to black belt if you think they're going to if they're going to, you know, they're going to leave your program. So. I think, I think it's like anything, what you want to do is you want to always have built in the student's mind what the next steps are. And one of the things that we talk very, um, we talk a lot about within our program, within our association, is black belt basically means the master of basics. So we, we are, it's already in their mind that they're getting to a certain level, they're mastering their basic skills, but they're training, and this might sound like a cliche, but their training can really now begin once they get their black belt ranking. The other thing I think that schools have a difficulty with and associations is they make their curriculum very bottom heavy. So, you know, it's like John Graydon from NAPMA used to say, they overwhelm their white belts and they underwhelm their black belts. Mm. So there's all this curriculum that the lower belts learn and then you get the black belt and you get to learn a new kata, right? And so what we do our best to do is we have a pretty dynamic curriculum that uh, black belts get to learn that incorporates other martial arts systems and styles. So when they come in, now they're learning new styles, new martial arts that keeps them going. And the other thing around that is before, either right before or right after someone gets their black belt, we sit down with them and we actually have a conference and we paint the picture to second degree black belt. And there's a path for them. And then every six months, they have intermediate testings again. So it's keeping them on track, just like you would any student. And so we have a curriculum um, that's all the way in that realm of all the way to third degree black belt. So when, you know, by the time somebody graduates to first degree, yeah, take a week or two off, let your body heal, but come on back because we're starting another rotation 
and we've got you on your road to second degree. Mm. Nice. When did you implement that? Boy, I've been, I've been doing our black belt testings like that for, you know, 10, 15 years. Because I realized as my school was growing, just like anyone, you know, you had people that said, oh, I, well, I was going to get my black belt. Now I'm done. Or they got and they got their black belt. They started training and they're looking like this is it. So I wanted to make sure that there was really something that encouraged them to come back. And it's not just curriculum either in terms of martial art curriculum. We also um, have a very strong leadership program as well. So particularly for young students, we're teaching them leadership skills, be helping them become assistant instructors that then become, you know, our instructors that we eventually hire. So we've got this bench going on, but th those are invaluable lessons. I mean, whether or not a student of mine ever worked for me, if they stayed with me from their preteens into their teens, I, I viewed it as a challenge of mine to make them as employable as possible, right? Yeah. Because they had intercommunicative intercommunicative skills. They could they could deal with adults. They could deal with kids. They they had great personalities, et cetera. They had confidence. Whereas if they didn't work for me, they could go down the street and work for whoever and just be awesome. And um, so I always took a lot of pride in that. And uh, and then the leadership team members, of course, they were um, they were uh, differentiated by specific uniforms, but they were held to a very high standard because they were the product that we produced, right? And so I'd always want to be able to have a new person walking in my school. I bring over a leadership team member, just introduce them and, you know, show how they have great respect and great ability to make eye contact and, and have that discussion. And then when they walk away, tell that mom, see that young boy there, Anthony, he was just like your son when he came here five years ago. Imagine where your son can be in five years. So you create this culture, right? Because you're not just developing great kickers and punchers, you're developing great human beings. Very, very well said. All right. Let's let's talk about some of the the, the roadblocks, the stumbling points in life. Martial artists, we've got a great toolbox to pull from. We've got physical discipline. We have hopefully mental discipline, you know, all the, the various things, the five tenets. I know that's some, something mm -hmm. that you know. Maybe the karate listeners out there don't, don't know what I mean there, but that's okay. When you think about some of the challenges in your life, I'd like you to pull one of them out and tell us how your martial arts allowed you to overcome. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think, we, I think we may have spoken about this last time. I... Um... I lost my brother when I was 17. Uh, he was 11. He um, died in a drowning accident. And um, it was a time in my life where within my own family unit, things were very, very difficult. My father was alcoholic as I was growing up, which is probably one of the reasons why I gravitated so much to my martial arts instructor, uh, because he was playing that role model for me. And it wasn't that my father... I didn't love my dad, nor, nor did I feel that my dad didn't love me. It was just that it was difficult for him to really be there and play that role for me because of his addiction to alcohol. So my martial arts instructor really, really played that role for me. And so what it did for me is it kind of set the stage of what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a father. Um, and I may have shared this story with you last time, I'm kind of digressing in this, but I remember very distinctly after one of my classes with Grandmaster Lee, I was um, about 14 years old. I'd already earned my junior black belt, and he used to have little conferences with students after class. Saturdays were always the big training day, so I'd drive in, and we'd have our big, big workout, and then we'd all sit around his desk and talk, and then people would begin to weed out uh, because they had to go, but I would always be the last one there, and, and I could always understand him totally, even though his English was very poor, for whatever reason, I could always understand him. And uh, on this one occasion, it was just the two of us. And I asked him a question. And, you know, when you're, um, when you're a teenager, a, a child, I think sometimes we ask questions of adults that we already know the answer to, because we're either curious, we want affirmation, or we're trying to catch him <laughs> on something. I don't know what I, why I was asking the question, but I did. 
And so, as many of your listeners might know, the word for instructor in Korean is sabum nim. It would be the equivalent of shifu that you might that you would have in Chinese and and uh, sensei that you'd have in Japanese. But in Korean martial arts, in Korean uh, language, it's sabum nim. And so I um, I asked him directly. I said, "Sir, what does sabum nim mean?" And he paused, and then he looked at me, and he said, "Sabum nim means father." And I was like, "Whoa!" And I just remember that hitting me right in the heart. And even though I don't think he was saying that because he was trying at in any way, shape, or form to over, you know, take the place of my dad, what he was saying to me was, "Is when you play this role of an instructor." That's the role you play. And of course, if you're a woman, you'd play that motherly, that maternal aspect of it. But that's a responsibility. And if you're going to choose into this work, you need to play that too. And at least that's the way that I took it. And so it was just such a, an amazing um, way for me to kind of, you know, set my own path. Um, and so going through that challenge, not really having a dad at home, that could provide that for me, but finding that in my martial arts instructor has helped me to come through so many, um, so many challenges because it was always that I knew that I had that behind me. It's like I, like he had my back, my instructor had my back and he was guiding me on that path. And um, yeah, so that was probably the greatest challenge that I've been able to overcome. Powerful, powerful stuff. Now you are an instructor and mm -hmm. are a father. Mm-hmm. What qualities do those two roles, parent and martial arts instructor, have in common? Mm -hmm. And what would not be in the intersection of that Venn diagram? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, I've set this up about martial artists, instructors playing that fatherly role. And I do have two boys who I'm extremely proud of. They're age 33 and 29 now. My um, my. 33-year-old uh, stayed with martial arts all the way until he went off to college, so he got his third-degree black belt. My um, my youngest son, who's now 29, still actively teaches, and he's a fourth-degree black belt. So they basically grew up in the studio. Um, and in fact, it's interesting because I remember um, after uh, I went through divorce and the boys and I were out, uh, it was maybe a year or two after that had finalized, and we were out together for an evening. And I had always carried this guilt that, oh my gosh, the kids were always at the school. They always had to be at the martial arts school. And I know that their childhood was not a normal one. I was never at home at night because I was always teaching. And we were we went out to a movie together. And then we went out for some coffee and, and we we're all sitting around chatting. And I said, you know, guys, I, I really I need to get this off of my chest. I said, this has been on my this has been on my mind for several years. I said, I know it wasn't easy growing up at the martial arts studio. I, I know that you were always there and that I wasn't home at night the way most dads were. And I said, I just want to say I'm sorry because I know that must have been tough on you. And I remember to this day, Jeremy, them looking at me like, what are you talking about? And looking at each other. And then my youngest turning and looking at me and saying, Dad, what are you talking about? We loved growing up at the martial arts school. It was like the best. We had all of our friends there. All the instructors were our big brothers and we got to see you every night. And I was like, whoa. And so I had this, this huge weight lifted off my shoulder. Now, that being said, one of the big lessons I learned is there are times that you need to differentiate between being dad and being instructor. And I had Grandmaster Lee tell me this at a very early age. He said, don't teach your own kids. <laughs> so my boys are very different. And my oldest, if I told him to punch harder, he would, he would, you know, he would noodle his arm as much as he could and look at me and roll his eyes like, what are you talking about? So I actually gave him to one of my staff members to teach. And he did really well. My youngest son would run through a brick wall for me. So, you know, I just had to know how to deal with those two personalities, but they both had their own, you know, powerful experience through it. But you do have to know as a, as a parent when to push and when to, you know, maybe advocate some of that responsibility to some of your staff. I've seen so many people that have a similar setup. They raise their children 
in the training space, in the dojo, dojang, whatever you choose to call it. But it doesn't have that sort of outcome. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes the children come to resent martial arts. Sometimes they come to resent their parents. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head. You didn't teach them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you need to know when to pull back. And now there are times with both boys that I would, you know, I would uh, interject but it, and, and whatever, and I would be part of that training. But for the most part, I wanted them to have their own identity. It is difficult enough when you are the child of the master instructor, if you will, to, you know, I, it, it's all, I mean, this maybe is a bad comparison, but it'd be like being a kid in a school where your, your parent was the principal of the school or being part of a church where your mother or father was the pastor of the church, right? It, there's some real pressure that comes with that. So I think I was, I was pretty conscious of that. Hmm. Yeah. It's something that I've discussed with a number of martial arts school owners who are raising their children and teaching them themselves. I grew up with that. I grew up with a, a husband and wife who taught and they had two children and they trained and yeah. I was similar in age to both of them. And it was challenging not only for the two of them and for their parents, but for those of us around them. Sure. Yeah. And I think all too often the parent slash instructor has a hard time making that separation. Yep. And, and, you know, it's, I've, I've observed, you might agree. It is difficult for people to maintain multiple distinct relationships. Right. And the other Uh, thing that, yeah. And the other thing that I would add to that is, Know where you want to have your relationship inside the dojang, but then mm-hmm. make sure that you're playing the role of dad or mom, if it's appropriate, outside when you're at home. Yeah. Right. You know, be able to shift gears, if you will. Uh, and I'm not saying I was always good at that. I probably was a little bit uh, less developed with my first son, and I learned my lesson and was able to play that roles or those roles better with my second child. But I think that's really important too. You know, they're not looking for an instructor sometimes or a coach. They're looking for a dad. And uh, you have to know when to, you know, play the different roles. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you had the opportunity to train with anybody, we're taking a hard left turn here. Yeah. Anybody in the world, anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? Yeah, you asked me this question last time. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I think I think for me, I, I would have loved at, uh, in the early days to, to train, obviously, with the Bruce Lees of the world and the Chuck Norris's. I've had a chance to train with Danny Nassanto. Uh, I think that he's an amazing uh, person as well. There, there's also something for me about the, you know, although I'm sure it was very, very challenging training, but what it would have been like to be, since I'm a Korean artist, martial artist, to what it would have been like to train in the early days of um, before it was even called Taekwondo. You know, like uh, like my lineage within Korean martial arts is the Chang Mukwan. Hmm. Um, and so I don't know if you're familiar with that, Jeremy, but before Taekwondo was was created in, in 1955, there were nine separate schools of martial arts in Korea called Kwan's, K-W-A-N. And they were basically colleges of martial arts. And each one of those, each one of those um Kwan's had a head instructor, a Kwan Jong Nim, if you will, and um, the person that uh, that was the head of of the Chang Mu Kwan, which is where my instructor's lineage is from, was named Nam Suk Lee, and so it would have been kind of fun to train and have that experience in those early days um, of of that. Uh, I think it would also. I think that they. I, I've always loved the eclectic nature and learning different styles. I think learning. Um, from somebody that was really adept at Muay Thai. I think that would be fun as well. So, yeah, I know I've given you a, a smorgasbord there, but, uh, you know, those kind of things in the early days, I think it'd be great. You know, it's like when you look at Bruce Lee now, his, 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 he watched video and he's still amazing. But, you know, you look at what people were doing or what they're doing now from an athletic standpoint, and people are doing 540s and 720s and things. Um, but to be at that place where, it was so outside of the norm and so over above uh, what was going on. That would have been really, really fun to be around. Undoubtedly. You know, I, I think there are people who pass on martial arts and people who advance martial arts and Bruce Lee absolutely advanced martial arts. But to speak to your, your smorgasbord comment, most people can't pick one. 
<laughs> people open their minds and say, well, yeah. you know, um, just in case I'm ever, you know, brought into court and given the opportunity to train with this one person, I better make sure I say a few names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't want to, I don't want to miss out. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, certainly great choices. And, and yeah, Dan and Asanto, we, I had a, another interview earlier today. We were talking about him on that episode. He's, he's an amazing man. If I, if I could just put my little plug in, I've, I've had Please. the opportunity to meet him on about two or three occasions here in Denver. Um, had a local instructor that would bring him in. Doesn't bring him in anymore, but brought him in for about two, three years. And I would, I would always stop by and say hello because they actually did the seminar at one of my students' schools. And I just have to say, I was so amazingly impressed with him, not only as a martial artist, I mean, incredible. And I trained with him at his uh, Kuhn, I guess you would say, um, Chinese word for school in, in Los Angeles. I did that years, several years ago with a group of other instructors. Um, but to not only see how adept he was, but when I met him personally, and just like I said with Grandmaster Wallace, how he took the time to greet me, to interact with me, and how I watch him interact with others, just the, the master's master, just a gentleman, humble, but as skilled as there as you can be, I was, I was blown away, blown away. Let's talk about competition. Okay. Uh, you know, we actually, I, I believe by, by this point in our conversation last time, we talked a fair amount about competition and it hasn't come up at all Okay. today. So what, tell the listeners about your experience with competition and your feelings about it. Yeah. Well, uh, my, I was a competitor, you know, during the high school, uh, high school years. And then I went off to college. I, I was a football player at Northwestern University. I went to college on a football scholarship. So I have those four years where I really didn't compete and then got back into competition after my football eligibility was done and was on the Illinois state team uh, for Taekwondo and was getting ready for nationals in 1986, 1985, excuse me. And my first child was born premature. So um, he was born like right when the competition was, so I didn't go. And then I got into my, uh, I got into my work life. I, I started a career with Procter and Gamble uh, right out of college, and went into being married and having a child and having a career. And so I continued to train in martial arts, but I wasn't able to put the time and energy I felt necessary to compete. So that kind of went on. It's um, went on the, by the wayside for several years, and then in the late '90s, the United States Taekwondo Union opened up a division for uh, you know uh, an older uh, an older group of people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and you know, it's kind of funny, but I think the division was 35 and above, something like that. And so I thought, well, you know what? I still keep myself in pretty good shape. I'm going to go for it. So in, um, in 1998, I got back into competition and uh, won the Colorado state title uh, for that um, division and then went on and got all the way to the finals in 1998 at nationals. And I lost in the finals mm. and uh, pretty disappointing. And uh, thought, you know what? Well, good shot. And um, then I decided, and actually it was, it was my, my, my former wife. It was like, you know what? You came this close. You got to go back and try it again. And I thought, you know, it's one thing to be a competitor when you're young and you don't have many responsibilities. But when you have a family and a business and to, and to compete at the same time, that training takes a lot of time. So the fact that she was encouraging me, I really view that still to this day as a blessing. So I went back in 1999. And um, happy to say that I won uh, the heavyweight um, the heavyweight championship for that age group, uh, black belt heavyweights, ages thirty five to forty or something like that. And I think I I think that officially I was I was never scored on in that tournament. Wow. Uh, the only time I got scored on, so let me here's my little here's my little caveat is uh, I I had, um, was fighting this guy's about six foot four. I was I'm about six feet, but I fought heavyweight because I knew. I could bulk up a little bit to hit the weight in that. And I may not be as big as them, but I could be faster and I was more flexible so I could utilize those skills. And so um, I hit this guy and scored a point. I looked at the, I looked at the, um, at the scoreboard to see if I had scored and he came around with a crescent kick and he, and he just, just touched my chin. So I was like, doggone it. So anyway, but then, but then he, uh, in a clinch, he fouled me twice by punching to the face. And he got his point taken away. So technically, I never got scored on. But that was, <laughs> but that was the only that was the only point that got scored on me. And uh, and I got him back because uh, 
this is, I think, a funny story as well. I was, you know, I'm, I'm mixing up with him and his buddies were around my, my wife at the time and saying, ah, oh, my buddies, our buddy's going to take your husband, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, giving her a hard time, good naturedly. And she says, no, nope, he's going to kick him in the head. And as soon as she said that, I did a spin hook kick. Hit the guy, the six foot four guy upside the head, gave him a standing eight count and won the match. So, <laughs> so there you go. There's my. Wow. <laughs> it's a very real life karate kid moment. And that it sure he is. Scores the point and then fouls you right. to take it away. And yeah, yeah. You know, and then you. But no, it was uh, it was a great um, you know great experience for me. And but what was really interesting is once I did win that tournament in '99, I was complete. And um, that was in Daytona Beach, Florida. The next year, the tournament was in Colorado Springs like an hour and a half south of me. And I, I could have, I would have already been seated into the tournament having won the year before. And I was just complete. I didn't even go to watch the tournament. I was done with that chapter of my life. But let's talk about that a, a bit more because that's not something that typically happens. People yeah. tend to hold on to those yeah. athletic yeah. achievements. They tend to define them as human beings. People that compete as martial artists tend to compete a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I have to say, for, first of all, um, I just there were, I, I listened to my heart because I just felt really complete with it. And I have to say, I never really got involved in martial arts just to compete. I love the physical aspect of it. I love the, the spiritual aspect of it, the mental aspect of it. I love just the activity. And I love teaching. And at that time, I had, uh, in 99, I would have had my school was going on five years. Yeah, by 2000 would have been the fifth year. And by that time, the school had grown to over 500 students. So it was a pretty busy place to be. And so, um, yeah, I just said, you know what, I've got, a, I've got a staff to take care of. I've got plenty of students to take care of. And that's where I focus my energies. Hmm. It makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. And I, I, think, I think there's a lesson in there for anyone hmm. listening, for any goal you know and just it, it well and the it, other thing too is 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 i think the question that we need to ask and this is not at all um to say anything against competition if people love that aspect by all means do it and do it for as long as you can i think the question becomes is you know that i was asking myself is where do i really want to make impact so if i go and i win a national title now i can use that as my way of maybe getting notoriety and, and then that enhances my ability to make an impact. And so that was complete. And now can, where can I make a greater impact on my students? I can do that by being there and teaching and, um, and helping them through their own growth process. You said it better than I was trying to. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Let's talk about the future. Okay. Let's talk about what, what your goals are. What's, what's getting you up in the morning? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, um, I I don't think that we've shared on this uh, recording yet, but I owned my martial arts school from 1995 until 2013 and sold it to a good friend of mine uh, because at the time I realized that I um, wanted to play a different and bigger game. So I've really been focusing the last five years on a career in inspirational speaking and life coaching. And um, so I do a lot of that. Uh, wrote a book in um, 2013, so helped promote that. Uh, so what really gets me going is I've got you know numerous opportunities to coach people on a one-on-one basis. I've um, I'm still very active in martial arts. In fact, I'll be teaching at one of our schools tonight. So my my students still have me come in on average of once a week to teach a class. So that keeps me going. But uh, yeah, I've got my my speaking, my coaching. I have a a corporate program that I do called discover your breakthrough you board breaking experience so i actually teach uh, corporate leaders how to break a board by first identifying a limiting belief and then identifying a breakthrough area in their life and taking through that process and uh, i'm also in the midst of developing a online program a um a self-leadership personal development program that i call mind of a champion eight weeks to creating a life of power purpose and passion and that's scheduled to be out in january Cool. Cool. And if people want to find you, if they want to find you online, social media, any of that. Absolutely. So my name is Chris Natsky. So C-H-R-I-S, N is in Navy, A-T, Z is in Zebra, K-E. And my website is chrisnatsky.com, all one word. 
And they can also check out the board breaking experience at discover. Or, uh, let me do that again. They can discover the, the board breaking experience at breakthroughu, B R E A K T H R O U G H Y O U dot org. Awesome. And of course, we'll have those links at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for everyone. So you can check those out over there. This has been great. And I don't know how you feel. I, I think we did do better this time. Yeah. Well, uh, and we did some di- talked about some different things too, yeah. which is kind of fun. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. You set the bar high last time. So we All didn't right. clear it by a lot, but it was, right. it was definitely better. All right. Good. Now, good. one last bit before we go, parting words for everyone listening. Yeah. What would you tell them? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that we have a very unique opportunity as martial artists and martial arts instructors. Um, you know, just by the story that I was sharing, I mean, there's often times that, um, we don't realize the impact that we can have on people. Sometimes we never do. But for those of you that are out there in doing martial arts, understand that um, there's a real great uh, opportunity, and I would say responsibility for those that we teach to help make this planet a better place. And, you know, like we always say is that, uh, you know, champions don't need to be told what to do. They just need to be reminded. And that reminding isn't just by giving them a reminder. It's also reminding so we always have the ability, whatever we're going through, we may not have the choice of the situations we're in, but we always have the ability to choose how we respond to them. So those, I guess, would be my, my parting words. I think it's pretty hard to come away from any interaction with Master Natsuki feeling anything but inspired. He's an incredibly positive person, and he's just as positive in person as he is here on the show. So thank you, sir, for your time, for your time twice, and I hope to see you soon. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the show notes. We've got some photos. We've got the links, the various sites that we talked about today. And don't forget, whistlekick.com. Use the discount code PODCAST15 to get some gear or a uniform or some shirts, sweatshirts, all the great stuff that we've got going on over there. And if you want to find us, we're on social media, at whistlekick. And my email address, the one that comes right to me, is jeremy at whistlekick.com. I thank you for listening today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.